they wanted to, somebody would like to know more about uh, like collections of Chicanx and Latinx collections of uh, sci-fi. Well, you were about to mention the one that my other colleague here um, at UTRGV did. You held it up a second ago. The, um... Oh yeah, that's, that's fabulous. <laughs> what happened to it? <laughs> Alter Mundos, a collection of, it winds up being a lot about uh, Chicano, Chicanx, uh, sci-fi rather than Latino, but um, yeah. it's, you know, it is like I learned, I'm amazed about how many things that have been around. Like it, it's a, it's a good learning. If you want to learn about a lot of uh, Latinx sci-fi, it's, it's pretty good. Um, and it's really interesting as well. Um, and there's some uh, fictional, uh, there's some stories in it uh, and some illustrations that are yeah. speculative. I'm going to be in um, an anthology that's being put out um, by Zoraida Cordova. Um, it's a YA um, Latinx science fiction um, collection, but that's going to be pretty awesome. Uh, I can't think of the name of it, but Soraida Cordova is the, the editor. She's a great writer. Um, YA, frankly, YA middle grade is where some of the like the 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 most badass stuff is happening right now in science fiction and and fantasy from the Latinx perspective. Such so really really great writing going on, and I just hope to see an explosion like that for adult sci-fi um, and fantasy as well. But I mean, it's a lot of it's getting published. A lot of it's selling really, really well. Um, you know, Carlos Hernandez, who is in one of the, I guess the Latinx Rising um, anthology, um, his oh. his series, uh, Sal and Gabby uh, Wrecked the Universe and the, the sequel Fixed the Universe or whatever. Those are really great um, sci-fi that um, upcoming anthology is called Speculative Fiction for Dreamers, a Latinx Anthology. <laughs> I see it here. That's the, that's the follow-up to Latinx. <laughs> that's the follow-up, and that, then the YA is something different. Yeah. I can't remember. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, I thought the Dreamers one was for YA. I think maybe originally, um, but now I think this one, it, they got a different name. Let me uh, get this formally started again. Uh, well, this one, this uh, webinar is being hosted by Somos and Escrito Magazine. And uh, welcome and are honored and privileged to have uh, <clears throat> such uh, well-known and uh, all of us are aspiring writers. I think you never stop being as aspiring <laughs> to be... Uh, uh, we aspire to something. But yeah, always aspiring to something. Um, and we touched on a number of uh, themes in the previous uh, mm -hmm. webinar. Uh, so, what, what, you know, where does somebody want to start off, you know, picking up on uh, some of the points we raised there, or some new area? Um, well, Armando, um, so we kind of left with a lot of questions as we uh, from the 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 last place, and there's some people have been writing questions in the chat. Uh, why don't we try to work through some of those? Okay. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and also we might remember some of the ones we read before. Who knows? Because there were some good questions in there. Yeah. Wait, I have to say hello to Eileen Gunn. Yeah, me too. Hey, hey. Hi, Eileen. Uh, she Eileen's published one stories uh, with Rudy Rucker many years ago. Hi, Eileen. Um, so this next question here um, from Christian. I was wondering to what extent Chicano sci-fi writers are in, are in the works by fellow Chicanos or Mexican-Americans that is written or let's see that is written in spanglish or bilingual what or spanish pardon me spanish or bilingual what is your experience of been using or avoiding spanish so like what i guess what spanish works are out there <laughs> like spanish language i mean there's just so much really great mexican speculative fiction i just finished translating um jose luis Sarate's, uh the what are, we, what are we calling it in English? The road, of, the road of salt and ice, or mm -hmm. ice, the road of ice and salt uh, from La Ruta del, uh, del Hielo y la Sal, um, which is this great like horror um, novella. And I've translated some of the work um, by Alberto Chimal and other Mexican writers from Spanish and English. But like using Spanish, I, I don't hesitate to use Spanish. And um, in fact, like just yesterday, I published a, an essay about how using Spanish in my Garza Twin series and that, that the first book, The Smoking Mirror, 
got it like turned down by about 24 different agents and a whole bunch of uh, publishers that were accepting unagented manuscripts. It's, it's, it's really hard. Um, even with the sprinkling of Spanish, like you could get away with more of a made up language. You could put like more words in Klingon or Elvish or, or, or whatever. Um, and get it published than putting Spanish in like Spanish is autumn. It's like, Oh shit, there's Spanish here. I can't read this any longer. It's just, him this kind of an attitude mm. um but yeah no I, I think it's it's definitely something that i do not avoid i'm of course i'm bilingual um and was raised bilingual so it's like very natural for me that's not the case of for every latinx author there are plenty of chicanx latinx authors who don't speak very much spanish and that's perfectly fine as well and th there should be no expectation oh you're a chicanx writer so there's going to be spanish in your work right well maybe not maybe there'll be a shit ton maybe there'll be none it's, can't really say. Mm -hmm. They can tell you you've gone too far, and they, 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 or they, they can't <laughs> understand it. So they, you got to watch out. <laughs> well, they were, I, I started out like a lot of people doing italics you know, uh, decades ago, uh, and sometimes doing the italic uh, italics in Spanish, comma the word in English de <laughs> defining it right. And after Juno Diaz. Uh, came out with Dominican Spanish where he didn't give a shit whether the Chicanos understood what his Spanish was. <laughs> I said, and he becomes world famous. I say, screw it. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm putting the Spanish in there. No italics. Maybe I'll help uh, some people a little bit with uh, some, uh, some context, but otherwise, nah, doesn't matter anymore. Well, I, I once saw the word taco in italics. After that, I, I said, I stopped talking about it. Now that's sad. That's <laughs> really sad. <laughs> yeah, I've got, so that I'm sorry, go ahead, big, Kathleen. That was a big breakthrough for Chronicle Books when I insisted that they not italicize the Spanish in my novels. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they had to have a big confab about it. And then they said, oh, okay, we'll do that. So I'm doing this, this chapter book series for HarperCollins. It's a six books. Uh, six book series for like young readers ages five to nine. So kids who are just starting to read who are graduating away from picture books into what in the industry is called chapter books. Cause little kids are like, Oh, I'm reading. It's got chapters in it and it's got lots of illustrations. And the series is called 13th street pitched as like a, a Latinx stranger things for kids ages five to nine. And one of the things, because the books are for reader, you know, for young readers or kids who are like struggling with reading or whatever. Um, I told them, I, I need to have Spanish because the main characters are Mexican American, they're cousins, they're going to use Spanish with each other. Um, and, you know, we were, we carefully took a look at like how I wanted to use sp Spanish and they were super accommodating. They were like, yes, that's fine. Let's use Spanish in it. And uh, I was frankly surprised. I thought, I mean, I've gotten so much pushback over the years from the use of Spanish for them to be willing to, for kids who are just beginning to read to, to insert Spanish words here and there um, was really refreshing. Now they're still italicized, but I don't provide any context or whatever. It's just boom, the word um, like in the, like within the first three chapters of the first book, one of the kids says, Ooh, cuckoo. And there's like no explanation at all. And it's just um, the fact that we're there now is, is kind of nice. Well, I have to say, that I learned all the swear words in English from my Spanish speaking cousins in Chihuahua because that was the only English they spoke. <laughs> <laughs> I had a strange uh, experience in writing a, the, the series that had, uh, it's five parts now, five stories um, uh, based on, uh, it's called The Adventures of Noldo and His Magical Scooter. And that's for uh, middle school, some high school maybe. Uh, the first four, I did them, I had them uh, translated into Spanish. My Spanish is pretty poor, uh, certainly in writing. And I had a hell of a trouble with the first publisher, first, you know, who had a, a, a person who spoke great Spanish, but she was from Spain. <laughs> and I'm writing, my story is different. Different in 19, in the 50s. Different Spanish. And my, my not, not only that, but my hero is about 12, 13, he travels back in time. So, you know, there's that language that I had to get attention to. But this editor, 
insisted on changing my Spanish that was that I was using 1950s Spanish. I knew what what those words were, you know. So I had a heck of a time. So here you have, you know, it's, it's kind of a strange uh, situation where I had this fight to keep words that I was using in the 1950s, uh, and someone insisting that no, you have to use this word. This is the correct word for this. Well, oh. Anyway. Uh, yeah, right now the, the the smoking mirror is being translated into Spanish by Livia Brenda, this great friend of mine who lives in Mexico City. And because the the main character is a Mexican American, they live on the border and, and stuff like that. I, the, you oh, know, yeah. we had some s serious conversations about the fact that they need to be speaking basically Mexican Spanish. Their mother is from Monterrey. They've grown up in both cultures or whatever. Um, but the editor who's working, um, revising the text or whatever, is from Spain. And she's like, well, I really don't think that kids in Spain are going to be able to understand. And I told her, I don't actually give a shit whether kids in Spain understand. <laughs> I just, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't, the, if any people from Spain who are listening, um, I apologize, but <laughs> Spain has got like a fucking chip on their shoulder about Latin American Spanish and they need to get over it. Like we read Harry Potter you know, in essentially the same version that comes from England, and none of our kids have any problem with figuring out what snogging is or what a kid means when he goes, oh, wizard. Like, I'm sorry, but Spanish teenagers can figure out what way and, you know, and, and bato and, and, and chale and stuff like that. I mean, they, they, they can get it. They'll figure it out from context. It's not. They probably love it, they probably love it too. Man. They probably yeah. would love it. It's their yeah. parent, the, the adults in the industry are like, yeah. oh, well, I don't know. No sé. Si los chavales de acá en la península van a poder... No, I mean, knock it off already. Come on. Our so son made, oh, sorry. Our son made a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy and all the sequels. And, you know, there was no explanation needed. It's British English. So I think that people could figure no. out those. And children can figure out the differences in dialect. I worked in one of the most uh, prejudi uh, uh, prejudiced environments institutions in this country when it comes to Spanish because uh, like uh, David was talking public about education uh, in <laughs> Denver public schools man uh, because all the all the the, the, the uh, higher uh, higher ups were like educated in the University of Barcelona or the goddamn or even some from uh, South America and so I was, I, I wasn't just low man on the totem pole. I was, I was uh, somebody that should not even be teaching and uh, those kids, uh, I had a great time and they did too. The kids had a great time for 10 years. Uh, I was finally ousted. I was going to say, I still get that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we have another question. We have a few questions here, but um, how would the panelists distinguish a magical worldview from a religious one? Hmm. Like that. Say that again. I didn't, I how didn't hear would the pan, How would you guys distinguish a magical worldview? Because uh, we had been talking about magical realism from a religious one. Or would you? And that comes up in like a few, like 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 many of our works, you know. Well, it depends on the religion, wouldn't it? Well, because, I, uh, I consider relig all religions as magical, so or vice versa. So. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, some religions are much more heavily codified than others. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're, they're going to be less happy, let's say, with, with um, imaginations that run beyond their boundaries that they've set for their members. Well, I think like in the works of like Fray Chavez or like, um, or Carmen Baca or even, um, what's his name, uh, Rodolfo Anaya. <laughs> Mm -hmm. A lot of those stories are like their traditional, like his final tales, and they're not um, really meant to be seen as like magical at times or like or fantastic, you know. It's more spiritual. Yeah. Uh, Rios, in, in your work, you you have this this blending of the spiritual and I mean, it's not strictly speaking religious in a codified sense, but of the spiritual and the magical, right? Don't or it, do you, or, am I reading that more or less right? <laughs> I don't know. No, yeah, I think I tend to just, for the characters, they just kind of grasp onto whatever they connect with, and then that gets infused in magic. So I think mine's more like where um, 
they're meshed together as opposed to being separate. But that's in, in my writing. I think, but I think that that's kind of a tendency in, in all of our work um, as a community, I mean. Yes, there's a lot of syncretism that goes on. Um, people drawing on, on the old religious values and putting them in, again into a new context. Um, I, would, and, I would question which, which religious values, if we're only talking about the Catholic Church, for instance, are yeah. we talking about the religious values that uh, burn witches at the stake? Uh, did the uh, uh, did the cover-ups of uh, child molestation for decades in in most of the world, as far as we know, uh, right. that is part of that religion. Well, it's certainly part of the institutionalized right. element of it. I mean, I think that right. when Kathleen right. says syncretism, I get that gets at the heart of it. Like, you know, the whole thing that Rios talked about, just like glomming on to what makes sense for people. It's a blending of spiritual and magical. And for your normal Mexicana or, or Chicana um, person, the it's, they're not thinking about it in an institutionalized way or like what the church specifically does and, and, and prescribes or whatever. Um, right. And I was thinking also with, um, with uh, hidden Jews in Mexico and New Mexico, there have been families that for generations were indulging in rituals that they had no idea what they meant or where they were derived from and it turned out that they were all of jewish ancestry and um it had just gone so far underground that people didn't always recognize why they were la lighting candles on friday night for example yeah. so or that's from, a form from of them well. <laughs> from the mexican crypto jews <laughs> i'm sorry i'm my my grandfather's side descended from some crypto jews as well from new mexico yeah. And both of my both sides of my family are as well. Um, we recently hired someone to have the genealogy done, and it was, you know, I I just love it when people bring me stories. When family members brought me the stories, I never cared that much about, you know, the the factual part of it, the the genealogy or the DNA or anything. But it turns out that um, there's quite a lot of information that can be verified now. Um, another question. <laughs> Uh, Tejas appears to be generating a lion's share of Chicanex science fiction literary production. Why is Tejas such a hot spot for this kind of writing over other Latinx regions in the U.S.? Porque somos más chingones. <laughs> <laughs> because we won the Alamo. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't know. I just think that there's like a, maybe a, a literary scene here that's a little more cohesive. Uh, there's the South Texas literary scene. There's the Hill Country literary scene. Houston's got a literary scene. And there's a lot of like small presses that publish stuff and there's i think just a a, a milieu in which you're with other mexican american authors rather than like in some of the larger coastal metropolises where you have to kind of fit into like a cosmopolitan identity rather than more like sp specific regional identity a lot of our work is rooted in geography here in Texas. Yes, you're telling stories to each other and you're telling stories to people who have the context. They know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and those of us whose families settled in other parts, my, I grew up in, in San Bernardino, California, and it was only in our family, in a, which was a big family. My mother's aunt, uh, brothers and sisters lived in East LA, but we would just tell these stories to each other. Um, and that was why I grew up thinking, well, we're the only Mexican Jewish Protestants in <laughs> Southern California, right? <laughs> but we weren't. <laughs> Isn't that getting away from the whole idea of uh, uh, who we are, where, where our origins are when we write science fiction? Isn't that like going to another dimension that's different from, from our origins? Uh, I don't know if Texas, you know, coming from Texas, I'm from San Antonio, Rudy's from San Antonio. Uh, anybody else here from San Antonio? No. Are you from South Texas, David? I'm from further south. Further yeah, south? I'm, I'm from actual South Texas, not from San Antonio. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to, sorry, I didn't mean to include you. I'm no, 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 I'm just kidding. It's the, the rivalry. <laughs> I know you're from South Texas. I always tell people, I always tell people, there are four hours of Texas below San Antonio. So okay. just so you know. And, and, and and Rios, are you from? No, you're from. Are you from California or from El Paso? I can't remember. Uh, I was born in California, but I grew up in El Paso, which is where I am right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, like we're we're the lion's share of this uh, panel. 
We're just well, well, we're yeah, I grew up. <laughs> I was born in California, but we spent every summer in Chihuahua, Mexico. So that was my whole world. Mm -hmm. Those two places, San Bernardino and, and Chihuahua, until I so, went away to college. South Texas is essentially like an annex of Chihuahua and yeah. Tamaulipas. So it's the, yeah. yeah, we're probably related. Yeah, undoubtedly. <laughs> we're all related. T tons of crypto Jews down here. Um, same yeah. kind of thing that you were talking about, like. Why do we sweep the way we sweep? Why do we do these things we do? Why do we eat the foods we eat? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. All right. Well, the, the, my question, I think, it, I, I don't know if I got an answer to it, but writing science fiction seems to be like going beyond our, uh, where, you know, where we're from. Is, is, that, is that like a natural, uh, uh, like, uh, what would you call it? Like a, a impulse to write for, maybe for all writers to write beyond their own uh, origins or use their own origins to go into another world, create another world. Is that what we mean by, by creating our own spaces? Yeah, well, I mean, I just don't want to create another world that is disconnected from the place I live now. You know what I'm saying? I, like, I want the other world that I create to have some continuity with the world I'm living in, maybe distant, but I can imagine like on Mars, um, like a, a suburb of some Martian dome city that's, you know, full of, you know, Tejanos from the, from South Texas. I, I just, you know, like, I, I want there to be, and that's why futurism is such a, a good term because it's projecting who we are now into the future yeah. without, without uprooting us from our sense of place and how that ties into our identity. Well, it's interesting that every generation of uh, Latinx people creates creates their own identity. Actually, you, you look by, back every 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 you know you know the, you know Chicanos from the from the fifties or different from the sixties all in the seventies yeah, and all that. That's true. And uh, and the ones right now. So uh, these weird very also they, when when you put them in a different place, they, they get they get different. You know, like I, I, I mean, late, 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 also all of a sudden we're getting uh, Chicanos uh, in the. Uh, in, in communities in the Midwest and in, in Alaska, you, you, you know, you know, uh, various places, and these these places create different, different things. I, I, I kind of find that interesting. So somebody's created a, a, a new Latinx identity, and I, I'm I'm kind of always interested in seeing how that goes. Um, yeah, that yeah makes sense. I, I think you can't help but react to the geography of the place where you live, mm -hmm. and also the cultures around you. So I live in the Northwest and have for over thirty years. And um, we're surrounded by people who have a very different, very different orientation, very different cultures than we are. Um, at the same time as, uh, well, there are a lot of activities that uh, Chicanos and Latinos do together here. Um, it's been really hard, I have to say, to maintain a literary community. We do have a group called Los Norteños. And um, in the late 80s and the early 90s, we were very active, but now it's it's gotten harder again to get people together. So, for example, where David lives, that's not going to be a problem because there are so many people there. Um, and I assume at least some of them want to be writers. I would like to uh, suggest to raise, raise the idea of having these kinds of uh, meetings, virtual meetings, I don't know, maybe once a month, every couple of months, um, we would be glad to host them. Sure, uh, that would be amazing. Yeah, we could get to know each other more and bring in more people, actually, more, uh, more writers. Yeah, we, we probably all need to talk more. <laughs> yeah, really. There's, there's strength in numbers, right? <laughs> yeah. There are. Let's yeah. bring in Celia Moreno Garcia. Where is she? Oh, you want to bring her in for the meetings? Yeah. Oh. yeah. I was I was like, what? And I'm looking at the chat. Like, <laughs> I'm looking for her around the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, were there any other questions that people had for us? I, Let's I'm, see her. Um, I ignored everyone who, who <laughs> chatted in the last section, but now I'm seeing We missed out on the last section questions. I, I was cop literally copying them when, when it ended. Oh, okay. Uh, Maybe I have one, like I noticed a lot of like sci-fi by like non-Chicano uh, writers is like particularly Anglo writers, they write, uh, they use kind of like ethnicity as originalism. And I've noticed that they wrote, they wrote about this a bit in Altermundos. It's like, they don't have, it's, it, I, and I think I put in the description, they react to the other with uh, kind of fear and titillation. And like, I don't really see that in, in our books. Uh, maybe you guys can talk about like maybe how we inhabit the other and 
embrace it. We are the other. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, I think that that's what makes it easier. Yeah, yeah that, it makes it easier. Yeah. yeah. When you're when you're aware of yourself standing in opposition to a hegemony or like an accepted norm of of being, um, then it becomes easier for you to put yourself in the shoes of of multiple others. Um, that's not true for everybody. I mean, clearly, um, I remember now. I remember one of the questions that somebody asked, and I'll, and I'll kind of bring it up. There. What is that? <laughs> Somebody Somebody's having like mute. a pachanga online, man. I was like, yeah. what the hell? Somebody's just having way too much fun. Um, one of the questions was, you know, about revealing things that are kind of private or interior or like within our community. The more we write about, uh, the more we write Chicano science fiction, the more we begin to talk about some of the darker corners uh, of our own community and Rios does this really really well um, grappling with some of the problems and um, you know the question was like you know how do you feel about that because the person who was asking the question is that sometimes I feel guilty about the fact that I'm airing dirty laundry um, but I mean I think that that's important we we can't just portray our community and our, our identity constantly in its um, in its status as being othered by white hegemony. There are moments where we've got to just focus on our community independent of its standing with other communities and the internal problems it has. I think that's important. Um, and yes, that does mean that people who are not from our community will read about those things, but they are essential. Like if we write what we feel we need to write, sometimes we're, we need to write about that. We need to grapple with colorism, you know, with all these things that are, that are problems in our community. And um, so maybe we could talk about that question if anybody wants to bring it up. But that was one of the questions from the, like, do you feel guilty about airing the dirty laundry of the Chicanx community? No. Well, I think oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Easy to answer. Um, uh, you look at well, that, that's history. where stories come from. Yeah, I, yeah. Conflict, right? Yeah. yeah. There, now I drew a blank. Who, Here's the name. Who wrote? Like the who wrote who wrote a uh, woman hollering creek? That was Sandra Cisneros. Yeah, Sandra Cisneros kind of broke that barrier by writing about the real lives of people. Um, and that's a Yorona story, by the way. That's kind of a reverse Yorona story. Um, and so I, I think it's important, certainly from a feminist perspective, to look at some of these traditions and look at some of these stories and see how they can be revisited and answered from the other side, for example. Um, one of the myths that's very prevalent in Mexico is the idea of, uh, and I think uh, I, I, everyone's name is flying out the window now, uh, the woman them. who goes to bed with a beautiful young woman and when she, he wakes up in the morning, it's an old hag, right? Oh, yeah. So um, that's, a, that's a very common myth. And it's very anti-female. It's this notion of women will just seduce you. But in fact, they're just, um, you know, they're, they're really harbingers of death. So um, I'm really looking for, for feminist stories, feminist perspectives that can work against that. Um, to address something that was, that was mentioned earlier, we were talking about science fiction. There is an, an active science fiction uh, community in Spain, which, you know, like, uh, like you, I didn't know anything about, except that I reviewed a book called by Cristina Jurado, called Alpha Land, um, and it is has very strong feminist perspectives. Um, and also there was this TV series that was on for a while called The Ministry of Time. Did anybody yeah. see that? El Ministerio del Tiempo, yeah, from Spain, yeah, yeah that was great. Yeah, it was really good. And so we would, I used it to sort of ramp up my Spanish a little bit. Um, so, you know, I'm always looking, yes, the stuff, Cristian, thank you. Uh, Carlos Fuentes wrote that the story, the little um, novella about oh. uh, um, oh, okay. what is it called again? <laughs> oh, Aura. Aura, that was it, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was made into a movie. I was like, yeah. Of oh, course wow. it was. <laughs> Which is a lot like the Yorona. Oh, I also wanted to say uh, Norma Cantu and I are editing an anthology about La Yorona, and we're looking for new twists on it. So get in contact with me if you're interested in writing about that. Please. That reminds me that I need 
to finish writing the thing that I told you a long, long time ago that I was going to write. Yeah. <laughs> so just, well, you're like, okay, David, now you're on the spot publicly. <laughs> I, I promise within Good. the next month to get it to you. Good. It's still open. Good. So, Yay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a really cool thing, so I, I want to finish it. Right. And send it to you. The title of it. Working, or at least the working title, Kathleen. Um, Crybaby. Mm. <laughs> I like that. Um, and when someone was talking earlier about um, how the, our stories have nothing to do with them, I wrote an essay in um, one of my collections called The Woman Who Loved Water. And it was about uh, that woman some years ago who drowned all her children Remember that? Yeah, yeah. Um, she had like five kids and she kept having kids even though the doctors had said you should not because she suffered from postpartum syndrome um, and she would get extremely depressed after each child and finally she just mm -hmm. snapped. Um, and so I wrote about it in the perspective of La Llorona and at the same time I traveled to Mexico um, through, uh, through El Paso and through... Uh, I visited uh, the college there where you teach David and went all the way to Saltillo, Mexico, where my ancestors are from. And I kept asking different people, well, what was the version of La Llorona that you grew up with? And each one was just a little bit different. And it was really interesting to see that progression coming from, from Saltillo up to Southern California. You know, Kathleen, speaking of um, like feminist reclamations of some of these stories, um, the Yorona story in particular, there are two that I want to mention because I, I think people ought to check them out. One of them is in Guadalupe Garcia McCall's book, Some of the Mariposas, which I translated into Spanish a couple of years ago. And in that one, you have a Yorona who basically, basically tells the the five young girls that she's like being a protector and a guide for, mm -hmm. she goes, you're afraid of me um, because the story you've heard about what I did was told by the man, my, my husband who survived. Um, the, and so you've got a completely distorted version of what really happened. I didn't, you know, when, when they came to the body of water and found my children, um, dead in the water and 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 I was dead as well they just assumed that I had drowned my children and killed myself but the truth is a lot more complex my sons slipped when they were playing and fell in the water and I was desperately trying to rescue them but I got there too late and they were dead and, and I gave up and so like that reclaiming and and and, right. and um, pointing an, an accusing finger at the patriarchal lens that makes us silence the voice of the Yorona so that all she does is wail and we never actually hear her story. Um, Irene Lara Silva, also, I think it's in her collection, Flesh to Bone, has this amazing version of the Yorona story that is just like so full of energy um, and, and such a, just a frankly amazing, I don't want to give it away. If I say anything about the story at all, it'll give something away. But an amazing, an amazing twist. Uh, yeah, no, she's, Irene is, She's fabulous at the work that she does is just, I highly recommend to everybody. Um, so that's one of the things, another thing that we can do um, with this, our speculative work is, is, you know, revisiting and reinterpreting and, and, and twisting and, and important ways, the, the often patriarchal colonial stories, because like the Yorona story essentially is a colonial layer of Spanish lore atop a very, very deep Mesoamerican tradition about um, about women who die either giving birth or die shortly thereafter, and and um, what they're transformed into, and the, that Soaeca, the 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 wind woman, um, the weeping woman, is becomes transformed into La Llorona after the the conquest, and. Um, Yes, and there are, um, there are details to the stories that's usually told that do have colonial implications, that he's from a wealthy upper-class family. And the story about her, that she is dark in particular, so you assume she's from Mas, Mas India, from a lower-class family. So there's that whole tension that's part of the story. I did a story that I'm probably going to get yelled at one day for if it gets published. 
<laughs> it's well, it's a novel, but in the novel there is a creature uh, that is being uh, manipulated by a, a stalker, a male stalker, and but the creature is an amalgamation of La Llorona and uh, uh, the, uh, the the Cortez's translator. Malinche. Oh, Malinche. 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 Or, yeah. So uh, they are. They are. If you think talk about com uh, conflicted uh, uh, memories and conscience and whatever mm -hmm. of either one of those people, uh, but then they're combined into one. Uh, well, I mean, I've got a reinterpretation. I, I'm fascinated to see that. Just a quick spoiler. Um, in Summer of the Mariposas, it turns out that La Yona is Malinsing. So um, I, I recommend like taking a look at Guadalupe's, like it's definitely very different from the obviously darker turn that you've got in your book. But um, the way she handles that is really interesting. The way she handles La Yorona actually being Doña Marina Malinsin uh, is, is really fascinating. Uh-oh. Well, try it on us, uh, Rudy. Uh, I, should, I should mention to everyone here that uh, uh, Somos en Escrito magazine has also uh, started a publishing arm. It's called Somos en Escrito Literary Foundation Press. We published two books already this year and looking for more manuscripts. Oh, yeah. good. I'll send you something. Okay. <laughs> hey, check out, um, I can put a link in the... Uh... Please. What I hear, what I hear uh, in the conversation is that um, uh, what people call sci-fi in our community is pretty broad. It's um, yeah. it's not limited by science, hard science, uh, let alone uh, uh, bug-eyed monsters, the old BEM BEM stories that come, you know, from the forties, thirties and forties. Remember that expression, BEM? Mm, yeah. Bug-eyed monsters. Um, uh, our bug monsters are like people that attack Mexico City, uh, you know, coming out of the the mountains and whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it's not like we, we have a pretty rich uh, resource among ourselves. That's why I think um, uh, the potential for being expropriated is uh, is always there. Um, okay, if you know if they pick up a writer, one of one of us, whoever, and um, makes a movie out of it and does well by it. That's, that's great. But um, that's one of the kind of the fears that I have. I mean, maybe it's more of an anxiety. Um, so that's, that's interesting. I think that's something maybe we, sh we should look at in more depth uh, at another sitting. Uh, we have about 10 minutes. Any other like thoughts you just have to get out? Uh, before we close, perhaps we should ask everyone what they have, uh, what they're working on, or what's coming out soon, or yeah. and remind anybody listening that you know support Chicano and Latinx Ch Chicanx uh, literature. Go and buy the books and everything. You know, I will do it alphabetically, uh, Kathleen. Sure. Uh, um, well, uh, my first novel, Spirits of the Ordinary, will be brought back into print next year. Uh, March 1st from Raven Chronicles Press. So I'm very happy about that. Um, I have a collection of stories, of linked stories that maybe I'll send to um, in a, Somos en Escribos. Um, I'm very bad at marketing my own work. So I, I'm much more interested in just writing it. So that's been around. Um, and then, um, I have a couple of things coming out in anthologies, including Inlandia. And, you know, I was thinking earlier when David was talking about how there is a community of writers um, in South Texas, Inlandia, which is published in Southern California, has been slowly building that sort of thing. It's not just uh, uh, Chicken X, but, um, but an identity of Inland California, which has not really happened occurred before we've just been treated like a big parking lot so that's an interesting development David? so um 
um, in the coming up in terms of publications is the launch of the series I was talking about, 13th Street. Um, for younger readers, I've got um, the first volume in the Clockwork Curandera trilogy that's coming out as a graphic novel um, series illustrated by Raul Gonzalez, Raul III. Um, the first volume is coming out this winter. Um, it's called, the first volume is The Witch Owl Parliament. Um, and it's that's the one that's set in an alternate 1865 where Northern Mexico and South Texas are a, a single nation called the Republic of Santander and their Meso Mesoamerican magic and steampunk technology coexist. Um, I also have another graphic novel coming out that's uh, a retelling of an adaptation of a, a Mayan um, sacred story, the, the Dwarf King of Uxmal. The, the adaptation is called the, the Rise of the Halfling King, and it's also the first in a new series of graphic novels that I'm doing that are adaptations of stories from Feathered Serpent, Dark Hatter Sky, my, my collection of myths. Um, and then I have my first picture book coming in next year. I'm, I'm working on, um, on two um, YA novels. One of them is like a, a green punk uh, novel called Tonansin, um, which is set a couple hundred years in the future. And it's about this little enclave. The world has been kind of divided up among these corporations that exist now in, instead of nations and they rule the world. And there are just a couple enclaves here and there of self-governed people and one of these enclaves is up in the mountains of mexico it's a, a a group of like zapotec people and they have been working for a couple of uh, generations to to create a goddess to create donancy the goddess mm -hmm. um a, a partial you know like a, a human girl that's raised up connected to the nets of the entire planet um poised when she's to become basically a goddess and save the world from from the greed and um, you know disregard for climate and so forth that, that's going on so that yeah, one is otherwise uh, you're not busy at all uh, no not at all <laughs> I've got like tons of stuff and then I'm working yeah. on my my Mexican vampire uh, YA novel um, called you Sacrilege Rios, Rios uh, you're next because you're De La Roja or De La Luz um, okay, what I'm working on, uh, short, another short story collection, and then not really much else. I mean, I've had stories in different anthologies. Um, I was recently in an anthology, uh, Both Sides, which was edited by uh, Gabino Iglesias, and that was published last month, which last month felt like a year so it feels like it was a really long time ago but um so yeah you should check that out um and then prior to that i was in an anthology called um burn it down um which was uh out through seal seal press um edited by lily Dancinger. i don't know if i pronounced her name right i'm sorry lily um and that one um has to do with women's anger and i actually wrote a little essay um, dealing with, I guess, certain aspects of a traumatic childhood, and I interwove um, stories of La Llorona and different um, ghost stories that I heard when I was when I was younger. Um, but yeah, I that's all I've really I've been doing very minimal because yeah. But I'm gonna keep going. It's all good. Good. Uh, Ernest, no, I'm sorry. Hold on, Rudy. Well, let's see, I've got uh, five young adult or middle grade manuscripts that I'm shopping around. Uh, they're, they vary uh, fantasy, uh, retells of, uh, of folklore, um, chapter book, uh, and uh, one of them is a YA prequel to the one novel that I've had published, uh, Closet of Discarded Dreams. Mm. So I just took the same characters, but put them into uh, uh, a teenage uh, setting uh, and uh, how they originally got into the closet. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different story. Uh, and I'm working on I I'm not I, I I think it's a middle grade 
storybook. Uh, and talk about taboos, uh, family uh, secrets and whatever. So uh, this one I'm writing in Spanish. Uh, oh, wow. David's probably going to have to help me with this. But uh, no, uh, it, it, I don't know why I wrote it in Spanish, but it's almost uh, in final form. And it's uh, called uh, uh, mi, mi Papi Me Quiere Tanto Que Me Pega. Uh, and so it's this kid, uh, who uh, tells you about different days in his life uh, when he gets the belt and he tells you about the belt and the, about the parts of the belt and he uh, he basically goes into into his imagination mm -hmm. to justify or to escape uh, the consequences mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> And Rudy's stuff is really good, guys. I, I've read some of those uh, middle grade and YA things that he's got laying around, and I, you know, I encourage anybody who's well, listening and looking for stuff like this to snatch some of it up. I know that Armando already is. I have, I have one unpublished short story I'm going to send Armando. Okay. Sci-fi. Time machine. All right. Ernest. Well, I, I'm uh, I'm finishing up a novel that uh, well, depending on who I'm trying to sell it to, is going is, is either about a aging Chicano science fiction writer who's lost track of where the where his life ends and the science fiction begins, or or or, or, or it's a slapstick comedy about the singularity. Uh, I'm, I'm also going to have uh, I have stories both in the, in Latinx Rising, uh, the 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 Paco Cohen uh, Cohen uh, uh, origin story where we explained how how he got from Texas to Mars, and. Uh, and, but also in, in the speculative fiction for dreamers anthology, I'm going to have a story called uh, "Those uh, Rumors of uh, Cannibalism and Human Sacrifice Have Been Greatly Exaggerated," which is uh, kind of inspired by my recent, by uh, the last few years of tra traveling in, in around New Mexico. So it's it's a it's kind of a wacky story there. I, I speculate about the future there. Well, wacky's good. Wacky's good. Uh, who else? Uh, uh, well, Scott, you want to mention your uh, book you're working on? <clears throat> oh well. Um, I actually have a piece coming in a, a magical realism anthology. <laughs> that is hilarious. And, <laughs> and I have some flash fiction that's going to also be in that spec Latinx, uh, speculative fiction for dreamers. And I also have a book that I've been trying to get published. Um, it's been an albatross around my damn neck for many years, but it's done. Um, it's called the Ramona Diary of SRD. It's about, it's part, memoir part uh traveling around the myths of spanish california mm. or should i say so-called yeah. spanish california yeah I'm also like native californian and um so i'm trying to get that out and um also a story collection so we'll see <laughs> called mexico apocalyptic tales because right. right. i call the uh the the upcoming uh mexican-american majority the mexpocalypse because our i recall when i first heard about it in the year 2000 that it was like it was portrayed in the media like the worst thing ever. Like it's going to be the end of all of all, of everything. The next apocalypse is, is looming. So I kind of call it the next apocalypse. Yeah. Right. Well, I guess I'm the only one here that doesn't have anything in the works as such. Got a lot of ideas, but um, mostly I've been concentrating on uh, getting some books out uh, on the, as I can say, the publishing arm of Somos San Escrito. Um, we published, the first book we published came out in the late January. It's called Insurgent Aslan. Uh, it's all about uh, Chicano liberation theory, oh, there we go. so to speak. And uh, the second one was, uh, <laughs> we'll have the, second one. Uh, the second one is uh, called Theorizing Cesar Chavez, which is um, a book written by a friend of mine uh, who looks at STEM studies, you know, STEM, uh, science, mm -hmm. technology, engineering, and math, through the eyes of a Cesar Chavez, who had he lived would have become a, uh, a scientist of some kind. Uh, and he uh, uses the uh, values and, and insights, logic, that Cesar uh, portrayed or displayed and demonstrated in his work to uh, look at these uh, studies and uh, how they should be more could be more effective, uh, especially with Latino students. Uh, I recommend them obviously highly to uh, to all of you. 
There's also the uh, the nonfiction anthology that we're putting out. And yes, we're, we're working on an anthology that uh, would be. It's been announced. Um, it's called Creative. Uh, creative uh, uh, was it um, Creative Reality? Uh, from our from our standpoint, our, our Creative Reality, and it looks at just how uh, how we see the world as writers and uh, through a uh, various genre. It's pretty much open to uh, uh, various forms of writing. So if you're interested, we can send those uh, more information, more detail to you, to all of you, okay? Great, yeah. Include us on anything like that. Right. We just had also... our submissions recently, yes. I forgot to say I'm working on another novel. I have about 100 pages, so mm -hmm. at this rate, I have two more years to go. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <clears throat> well, without further ado, then uh, I appreciate um, your staying with us and spending another hour with us. And uh, we're going to be uh, making this uh, discussion available uh, through our website, somosanitsgrifo.com, and uh, <clears throat> on those, all, those, all those other social media. So uh, stay tuned. We'll send you the contacts. <laughs> well, hello. What is that? Uh, I got my, my, my yes, sí, un tecolote. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> we're just going to start playing with toys. Just toys, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is where we bring out the sock puppets. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just, this is just like a really cool, like, it's a cool alebrije from Oaxaca. That's <laughs> nice. Yeah. I had a, I had a oh, yeah, I like that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I lost my tecolote. Yeah. Oh, dang. <laughs> <laughs> All I have is my cat. Yeah, yeah. passing back and forth like behind you is real cute. Yeah. Total control. My, my totem. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome, yeah, guys. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. everyone. It was great chatting with all of you. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Nice yeah. meeting you, Rios yeah. and Scott. And yeah, nice meeting you. Everyone. Nice Bye. Bye. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks to thank everyone. You. Very yeah. nice to meet you. Thank you for Bye, all the people who have joined us. Bye-bye. Oh. Buenas. <laughs> Buenas tardes.